Welcome to Hemp Barons. I'm Dan Humiston. And on today's show, I'm in Denver with my good friend, Bob Hoban, who's the founder of the Hoban Law Group, which is the world's premier cannabis law firm. You know, Bob's been a lawyer for hemp companies for a long time, long before hemp was the rage. And now he has offices throughout the United States and around the world. So he really has his finger on the pulse of the hemp industry. We had a great talk. He shared a lot of good stuff about stuff that is happening now and some ideas about where he thinks the future will be. Let's join my conversation with Bob Hoban of the Hoban Law Group. Hey, Bob, welcome to the show. Dan, thanks for having me. Good to talk with you today. Well, Bob Hoban is the president and founder of the nation's, or I should say the world's premier cannabis law firm. So, Bob, we've known each other for a long time, but I'll tell you what, the name of the show is Hemp Barons, and Bob Hoban, for those of you that do not know Bob, Bob was hemp before hemp was cool. Really, welcome <laughs> yeah. to the show. Thank you. That's, that's, that's definitely one way to put it. And hemp is king right now. <laughs> well, you can talk to us more about that. We've had a lot of guests on the show talking about how things have just really changed since the passing of the Farm Bill. And think I'd like to hear it really from somebody that's really in the trenches. I mean, you were there before the farm bill was passed and you're one of the driving forces behind getting the farm bill passed. So maybe just give us a little bit of background as to where, you know, how we got here and where specifically where we are right now. Sure. I got into the hemp side of the cannabis industry. Our introduction was on the marijuana side, opening some of the first dispensaries in the state of Colorado and Washington and Oregon and, and then down the road. And then the hemp opportunity came around as uh, about as early as 2009, when a company called Canavest, which is now CV Sciences, contacted us and began to seek some counsel on the legality of CBD or cannabinoid products that they were selling at that time, which gained a lot of attention and traction. And there was a question about legality. There was also a question about, sounds funny, but they were asking lawyers to help them devise their distribution strategy. And we then went down that road. And CB Science is the world's leading CBD companies. But back then, they were looking for some guidance and we were happy to provide it. Hemp Meds is, at least at that point in time, was a sister company. They're both based out of San Diego and they were the two leading and largest distributors of these products back at that point in time, which seems like eons ago, but it was uh, less than 10 years ago. Is CBD a legal substance? Where is it derived from? What's it derived from? Is it in the Controlled Substances Act? How do you distribute it? How do you advise distributors of the legality? Those are some of the questions that we had to handle. We address them. Those companies have become wildly successful. And because of that, probably 30 of the top 50 brands worldwide remain our clients and rely on us heavily for not just regulatory guidance, but corporate M&A activity and the like. So that's that's how we got into it. It's extraordinarily exciting. And I thought, frankly, that the CBD entry was saturated two years ago. I couldn't believe it when people were calling me two and three years ago saying, how do we get into this industry? Uh, my opinion back then was it's too late. Well, if this demand is truly what it prepares to be, it's insatiable. We've seen now Carl's Jr. is going to feature hemp-based CBD burgers. Who'd have thought it, you know, Dan? I had launched a protein bar here. There's a big sign on the board that said $2 for a CBD shot. And that's at the protein bar in Denver. This is everywhere now. It's mainstream. So specifically, what did the farm bill do that made it different? All right. So let's take it back to the first farm bill. So when I talked about CB Sciences, Canavest, and I talked about hemp meds, that was prior to the 2014 and farm bill, which really cracked the roof open of the CBD industry. Because what that did was it allowed states to enact programs whereby they their participants could engage in research for scientific, agricultural, and market-based research. So the state of Kentucky actually sued the federal government in that period of time and said, how on earth can we do market-based research without a market? And that cracked open the ability to create commercial for-profit enterprises in this space. Uh, And then Congress followed and and paved the path and said, you can transport this product through interstate commerce, 
under that 2014 Farm Bill. But there were some problems with that Farm Bill, problems such that we, our law firm, on behalf of a number of great clients, sued the DEA and got a very favorable result that declared that CBD is not itself, per se, a controlled substance, and that hemp wasn't a controlled substance. It was produced under that Farm Bill. But that Farm Bill was narrowly interpreted by the DEA and by other federal agencies to say, oh, this is for research purposes only. Well, how can you have market-based research without a market? And that was the debate that began, and that's what sustained the industry until later this year. Then 2018, we had the most unlikely source of the most significant cannabis reform in U.S. history was Mitch McConnell. (laughs) Because of Kentucky's rich history with industrial hemp, they passed the 2018 Farm Bill, which makes it absolutely clear, unequivocally, this is not a controlled substance and that products therefrom are not controlled substances. It authorized different federal agencies, the USDA in particular and the FDA in particular, to govern these products. And that's where we are today. So when institutional capital, major retailers, so forth and so on, saw this, They came in in a very, very, very big way. And that's the the hot CBD industry that we see today. Oh, yeah. We're hearing stories of CVS and Walgreens. I mean, this is happening. It's happening fast. Let's pump the brakes here for a second. I know it's not the same in every state at this point. You know this far better than I, why everybody isn't in the same place. Yeah. So let me let me start with the point you just raised about retailers. So most of the retailers that you've mentioned that that you read about, they're clients of ours. And we've been working with them for years to help them develop their strategy to be ready. And some of them have settled on just allowing the sale of topicals. Some of them have gone so far to allow CBD and CBD-related or cannabinoid-related products to go into the marketplace. But remember, if you're going to sell these products in mainstream, you got to go through the retailers. And the retailers will dictate the policy. But remember, that retail shelf space is already owned by somebody else. So can you create a CBD company? and just hope to go out and be featured on the shelves of the CVS or the like, there's some major challenges there because that shelf space is owned by nutraceutical companies, cosmetic companies, companies that otherwise control the space. So those companies are positioned to be the leaders in this space because they already control the shelf space. So they're looking for contract manufacturer partners. So if I were going to go out and create a CBD company, can I get on those shelves? Those are some questions that are challenges. Why haven't all states moved forward? Because right now, until the FDA gives us guidance, they haven't spoken as to what is the specific pathway. They've advised that there will be a pathway and that there is a pathway, but they haven't specifically said what that pathway is to the marketplace. So some states, some retailers, some manufacturers, they're waiting for that pathway to be given to them, to be alineated by the FDA and, frankly, the USDA before they go forward in a major way. As I like to say, it's the United States of America. When has any U.S.-based company ever waited for the U.S. government to tell them they could or could not do something? (laughs) So that's how this industry has come out of a box. And I don't say that flippantly, like the company should do whatever they want. I say that because there are existing standards in the FDA under the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act that applies to all foods and nutritional supplements. So all of these things are in place, and the good companies have been advised for years to follow those tenets. And that's why they're world leaders in this space. But new companies coming to the mix are acting as if there's no standards in place. So states have been slow to react. Some states have said, well, we're not going to allow anything to happen until the FDA speaks. Well, the FDA is probably not going to give us formal clarity until at least late in this year, if not 2020 or beyond. It's going to be an evolving process. And that's why a lot of states have pause. But forward-thinking states, proud to say Colorado is the most forward-looking state in the, in the hemp or the CBD industry, in that it has actually enacted guidelines for the production of CBD or other derivatives from hemp as a food and a supplement, and has been a national leader in that respect. So good things are happening. It just hasn't happened to the point where most conservative institutional capital and institutional operators would just go into it with no holds barred. And frankly, that's the hesitation that the state have as well. I guess what you're saying is there's still some people on the sidelines on this one, but (laughs) but not as many as there were at the end of last year when the farm bill was passed. That's correct. That's correct. 
And, and, and that also begs the question, who are the major players in this industry? Who will be the major players in this industry? Is it cannabis-based companies or companies that come from the cannabis or the cannabis financial world? Is it companies that come from the ag world, the food world, the supplement world? This is a collision of multiple industries right now centered around cannabinoids from hemp. And it's really unclear who the winners of that game are going to be because the cannabis industry feels like this is theirs. The supplement industry says, well, we've been doing this for decades. This is ours and so forth and so on. That's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out and to be part of that. You talked about the FDA. And I know that there are different thresholds based on how they classify this. CBD right now is being classified as a supplement, not as a drug. Well, this is the, this is the thing that the FDA statement is that you're not allowed to sell cannabinoid and rich products because they're just not approved products right now. They're not dietary ingredients, meaning they're not considered food. They're not dietary supplements, meaning they're not considered supplements. They're not considered drugs, except for drugs that have been approved, such as Epidiolex and some others that might be in the pipeline. So the FDA's position is that these products have not been approved. But here's the rub. If you extract a distillate from an industrial hemp plant that contains cannabinoids and terpenes and the like, so long as that THC level is not above that 0.3% threshold, it's no different than what's always been in the marketplace. There have been hemp oils with those same constituent components in different ratios in the marketplace for decades and decades and decades. And this is the same issue that they're wrestling with in Europe with what's called the novel foods concept. How do you designate this? So the FDA says no, even though it exists, but then they talk out of the other side of their mouth. And the only enforcement that we've seen to date is enforcement based on claims. I can't go sell a product and say that this cures breast cancer or that this will help with any sort of a medical or physical condition because it hasn't been approved for that purpose. And unfortunately, the CBD industry, they want to take advantage of it. They want to be able to say, this helps you with condition A, B, and C, but no food, no product, no ingredient can do that unless they've gone through an FDA approval process. So the FDA is saying, don't make claims and you can't do this, but they're also not enforcing. That's not a reason to do it, the lack of enforcement, but it's also telling about how this is going to be perceived. You know, one of the most interesting things that I see is that there's there's hundreds of patents out there held by pharmaceutical companies and entrepreneurs and otherwise. And those patents, I think, are going to shape where this industry goes. For example, if you look at a patent that might be held by a pharmaceutical company, For a drug, that same patent might apply to an over-the-counter food or supplement because it might be very general. And So what's that patent holder going to do? It's going to try to participate on both the drug side and the food or the supplement side. It's not going to try to shut down its competition. It's going to go to its competition and say, if you don't make a deal with me for a royalty interest on every unit you sell, we will shut you down or at least try to through the legal process. Mm -hmm. So the system is set up to allow all of these lanes to exist at the same time. And guess what? The FDA knows it. So that's one of the reasons I think that you've seen this slow play. Wow. Well, you mentioned a minute ago stuff that's going on in the UK. And I didn't mention this at the beginning of our podcast, but you've got 15 offices outside of the United States. And is that just because the same explosion that's happening here is happening all over the world? Yeah, but even more so in Europe in particular, because uh, Europe, Japan, Latin America, these governments, these laws in other countries, they carve a very, very clear pathway to allow these products into the market base on a country by country basis. So you've seen tremendous development in those places. And one of the reasons we build offices outside of the U.S. is not only to provide legal services, but we've literally created and built the global cannabis supply chain in large part through our clients, through working with government partners, and through understanding the pathways that do exist for these products right now and connecting. A lot of what we do is connect a supplier in Colombia with a buyer in Poland who wants to manufacture products and distribute them in Germany and Czech Republic. That is something we deal with every day. And that's one of the most exciting things to be a part of. Literally on the ground, pioneering the creation of a global supply chain for hemp, which is what we've also done in part with the high THC or the marijuana oil, or it's a far, but it's a far more limited and controlled marketplace. Mm-hmm. Well, with that vantage point, look into the Bob Hobe and crystal ball and tell us where the great opportunities are going to be in hemp in the next couple of years. Well, so this is where I might differ from a lot of the people that are so so-called bullish on hemp. I think that the opportunities are going to equalize for the different sectors of the hemp plant. What do I mean by that? I mean, right now, everybody's looking at cannabinoids. 
and technology to extract and or formulate cannabinoids and cannabinoid products. And while I believe that that's going to be a robust and stable market, there's going to be some challenges, both from a regulatory perspective and from a supply chain perspective over the next several years. And then, frankly, there's going to be so much CBD, for example, produced in the U.S. that's going to cause the the market to just fall apart. The price is going to drop through the floor, and that's going to leave a lot of people that have invested large sums into production facilities and distribution channels to lose a great deal of their investment or at least their upside on their investment. But that's also going to cause an equalization among some of the other great things that this plant can do. When we look at uh, the 50,000 so-called uses of the industrial hemp plant, some of the top things that are readily available with scaled technology are fuels and our plastics. And another interesting component is the grain market. The Canadian hemp marketplace has controlled hemp seed, hemp grain, if you will, for primarily oils and just straight hemp seed production. They've been world leaders in that marketplace. And the U.S.-based marketplace with its zero to almost 100,000 acres in less than four years, and we're going to probably double that in 2019, is going to put the U.S. in a prime position to seize a large share of that grain market production. So the grain from the seed, the fibers, putting fiber into the marketplace for U.S.-based manufacturers of automobiles and door paneling, such as Ford and the like, those things are happening right now. Innovation offices are looking at ways to use what's called biochar from from hemp to produce graphene, which is a supercapacitor, a conductor. You've got companies that produce ethanols and fuels looking very, very deeply. Some large oil producers are clients of ours, and they've come to us to help them devise their strategy to say, how can we make a biofuel based on industrial hemp components because it lends itself so readily to that? And then plastics. That's where I would invest if I was looking to invest in the hemp industry. I would look at the plant holistically. I would invest in farming applications that look at the plant from a supply chain perspective, not just a CBD or a high cannabinoid perspective. And that's where I see things going. And I think that that's going to lend itself very well for the capital that comes into it to be more ag or sort of traditional industrial based versus what we're seeing right now, which is largely tied to the cannabis financial elements driven by CBD production. Well, you heard it, folks, right from Bob Holman's crystal ball. That was it. <laughs> that was it. That was crystal it. ball. <laughs> <laughs> Put it down, mark it. Bob said it today. We've been speaking with Bob Holman, who is the founder of the Holman Law Firm. And as I said earlier, one of the pioneers in the hemp industry. Long before hemp was cool, Bob was knee deep in the hemp industry. I have all of Bob's information on our website and and if anybody needs any information, I'm sure somebody at Bob's firm is there to, will be there to help you, even if you're in another country. So, Bob, it's always great to have you on the show. I'm sure we'll be talking again soon, but any closing mark for our listeners? No, I, I appreciate the time, and it's always good to talk with you, Dan. And, and at the end of the day, for those folks that are looking at the hemp industry, I would pump the brakes. I'd tap the brakes. You don't have to pump the brakes hard, but as you look at investment and opportunities, tap the brakes and Prepare for what tomorrow brings, not necessarily what today brings. That's just good business advice overall, but it's particularly useful in the hemp industry. Well, I appreciate that, Bob, and I appreciate you being on the show. Let's stay in touch. Good luck. Sounds good, Dan.